So thank you for sticking around and uh, late into the afternoon and giving me a chance to talk to you a little bit about some really sort of big picture stuff about some things that I've been thinking about with respect to early translational research at UCSF and some very preliminary um, plans, early plans, near-term plans for what uh, what we hope to be able to um, to uh, do in the sh in short order. So as Clay had just mentioned, I joined CTSI very recently, uh, three months ago to be exact, um, as the director of early translational research. And before this, I was at Genentech for seven years in clinical development and in various different capacities. And my most recent role was uh, as the head of um, infectious diseases, cardiovascular metabolism, and respiratory programs in, in early clinical development. And before that, I was at UCSF for for a number of years as a clinical fellow in pulmonary and critical care, a research fellow, and then on faculty. And I also um, had directed the high-risk asthma clinic at San Francisco General. Um, and why now? Some people have asked me, why are you coming back? And do you not like Roche or, you know? So, uh, and, and it's actually not that. It's not really so much a push, but it's really a pull. I really think it's a, a very exciting time to be doing translational research, especially in the, in the setting of a, a place like UCSF, for a variety of reasons. UCSF, I think by far, uh, has some of the best science and some of the best scientists around. And those are obviously the two fundamental building blocks to be able to do good translational research. You would look around the campus and there's real intent and commitment to making translational research work better. There's uh, a lot of energy being, being expended into trying to figure out how to make translational research work better both here in academia and in the industry all around us. And, um, and having good basic build, building blocks of good science and good scientists to work with is a great place to start. You look around the campus and there's real intent and commitment. You look at what's being done uh, through the EVC's office with Decade of Human Biology. You look at what's being done at QB3 and, and, and many other pockets around the campus. People want to make this happen. And then, of course, uh, the leadership here with Jeff in the EVC's office and Sue as, as the chancellor, um, there's, there's commitment. Uh, external to UCSF, it's, it, I think it's a really exciting time. There's, it's dynamic. Lots of things changing very quickly. There's uh, full acknowledgement and full recognition that things could be working better. Um, and thing, uh, not that things have been working horribly, but a lot of things, there, there are a lot of variables that are rapidly evolving. And therefore, new gaps are sort of being identified. And funding agencies, um, by way of NIH and, and regulatory agencies and, and industry from startups all the way through very large companies are acknowledging this and looking for new ways to make this happen better. And why? Because it's really important. It's really a mandate. Because the great science that we have here should be translated to better help. Um, my goal and, and commitment is to really facilitate and enhance and accelerate early translational research in, at UCSF. And the specific tactics for how that's going to happen is going to evolve over time. I'm going to share one little bit with you a little bit later, but, but really um, spend a little bit more time just talking about the framework that I've been using to think about where the gaps are. So what I've been doing, I've been on a listening tour, meeting with lots of folks around the campus, some that are in this room, to understand what's been going on on campus with respect to T1 translational space, and what works well, what doesn't work well, what's missing, um, and, and, and you know what, what they wish they had that they don't have. And then I'm also using that information to, to put together a business plan. So the framework that I've been using to think about this is, is, is laid out over here. So translational research, there's the early, there's late, T1, T2. Under T1, uh, we're talking about science, how science gets translated to invention. 
uh, or discovery, and, and I'm using invention to be synonymous with that which, is, uh, which results in a patent. Recognizing that not all discoveries are patentable and, and non-patentable discoveries can also result in improvement in health. Um, and then also uh, there's the translation of this invention or discovery to a product. And I'm using the word product to mean that entity, drug, device, or diagnostic, or software, whatever it is, that can then be used to improve health um, out in the community. Um, and then there's the other layer of bench to bedside, bedside to bench, and then how this gets then translated in the community, and really how then there's that feedback from community back to bench and bedside to inform the science that occurs. In, in uh, ideally and in reality, um, that feedback process is iterative. I think one can argue that that feedback process could work better and we should be thinking about how that, that cross-fertilization could be facilitated better as well to, 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 to uh, create better science. And then in terms of looking at where does this work at the different ends of the translational spectrum occur, um, academia traditionally has been involved with work that's fairly early, bench, uh, at the bench, some bedside, and then um, science to invention, and sometimes a little bit beyond that. Um, uh, 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 traditionally, uh, when there is an invention, startup companies would uh, would come and, and and get involved, and then and then when those inventions have made a substantial progress to becoming a product, larger companies would then take on that uh, that program either by acquisition or by strategic partnership. And then the other aspect is larger pharma, is in, in, uh, traditionally and in the pa uh, historically, has been um, really doing a lot of investment into their own R&D pipeline. So they've been putting a lot of resources into generating their own pipeline and doing their own research and development. And I think all analysis would point to the, 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 the um, conclusion that that investment has not been nearly as fruitful, fruitful as they had hoped. And so they're looking for other, other ways to fill their pip pipeline as well. And what's happening now, I mean, uh, the number, of, there are a lot of variables at work. Um, venture, venture resources are more scarce than they used to be. Start, it's harder to get startup companies um, going, and it's harder to keep them sustained until a time when they're considered to be attractive to a larger strategic partner. So there's that, that gap between academia and startups is, is increasing. The gap between startup companies and large pharma, and when large pharma comes in, is also increasing for a variety of reasons. One, startup companies can't stay around quite as long as they used to because they don't have the venture money that they used to. And large pharma is choosing to wait a little bit longer to invest in companies until sufficient risk has been mitigated in those companies. So those gaps are being, um, being increased. So when we talk about a dynamic environment, this is sort of changing real time, and these gaps are, um, are, are moving as we speak. And so for, uh, so for, um, so now large pharma uh, is not, is, is, a lot of large pharmas that, that you've probably heard about in the press um, are moving away from investing into their own R&D and looking to academia and looking to get engaged more actively with the research that's going on in academia to, to, to um, in, par, in, par, in part populate their R&D pipeline, which from where we sit, I think, is really an opportunity for a variety of reasons. They bring with that uh, potential resources, not just monetary, but capabilities, things that we don't have in the university because we're not primarily driven to do drug development. They bring their process development capabilities. They uh, bring um, their manufacturing capabilities. So I think there are a lot of uh, potential opportunities that we ought to be looking at in leveraging 
in this new dynamic environment. So looking at those three different levels, um, bench to bedside, science to invention to product, and then academia to industry, you know, they're, they're uh, there, there are gaps from each of those steps. So science to invention. Um, are, how much science is really being left on the table without getting patents filed in this university? And how do we get access to that science so that whatever support it needs, it can get to, to move along? The, the science with the potential to actually impact health. And then invention to product. What keeps those those uh, inventions that uh, that undergo um, getting patents filed from moving along to getting licenses done is it that that those capabilities are not easily accessible to them and how do we how do we identify those to actually provide the necessary support to move that along bench to side and bedside to bench do we have the infrastructures that we need to actually allow that bench to bedside, bedside to bench to happen? And what are those things? Are those things that we have to build internally? Are those things that we can try to access and leverage from, from the outside? And I think these are all things um, that I've been thinking a lot about, and I know lots of people here have been thinking about and working actively on. And then community to bench, and then community to bedside is, is the other um, important piece. And then academia to in industry, we're in a dynamic time. It's uh, it's going to be interesting. I think there were were we're open, but also the industry is also open to to really forming collaborations that make sense, that are fit for purpose, not one size fits all, which I think has been more the approach historically. And I think UCSF is a, in a really unique unique position to really lead and influence and drive this transformation that's occurring in the in the translational research space for a lot of reasons. We have great science as we talked about and great scientists. We have this institution that really has an amazing reputation, but also around us, we're probably in the most rich um, biotech innovation uh, in the world, area, in the geographical area in the world. So we have a lot of resources around us that we ought to be tapping into that we need to leverage. And I, and I think that's really exciting. There's a lot of, lot of opportunity there. So, 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 what, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, specifically about one of our programs that was designed to address Three minutes. I have three minutes? Oh boy, okay. <laughs> and I need to go fast. So um, to, to address uh, invention to product stage. So T1 Tra Translational Catalyst Award uh, meant to identify the best projects and then, and then bring in missing pieces and help the, the project along to a place where it's, uh, um, it's uh, then thought to be attractive uh, to a, some, some, some uh, specific milestone. And um, it's a phased award approach. And I'm just gonna share with you a case study of Bob Nussbaum, who applied for this program, and the punchline is he actually didn't get the development award. But he did, what, what happened with his, um, his uh, uh, program really beautifully illustrates the, the strength of this program. And that is, he uh, applied to, test a commercial, not commercial product, the product and development at a, at a startup company in a disease indication that was different than what the company was working on. So, um, and what the company was planning on, he really didn't have any idea. So using a consultant that CTSI provided through the T1 Catalyst program, he was then able to work out a, a, a collaborative, uh, collaborative agreement with the company to be allowed to use the compound that they had and the disease indication that he's interested in, we were then able to also provide them together, the company and him, and then a collaborator, uh, a, a, a translational grant writer to apply for uh, Michael J. Fox Award together, and they've been invited to uh, apply to do a full application now. And 
we're in the final phases also of getting uh, an MOU, a memoranda of understanding written with this company so that should this product, this, should this invention ever become a product in this particular disease indication that UCSF would get something back for the investment that we made for, for getting this program going. So um, T1 Catalyst Award, we did three cycles. We uh, got some feedback that the pilot grants that were given through the program are thought to be very helpful. Customized consulting service that was provided was very useful, and you can see that in the News Palm case. Um, what we decided, what we're working on now is thinking about how we can make those, those, uh, those aspects of the program that are thought to be most valuable more broadly available. Um, and in the process of thinking about how to broaden this T1 Translational Catalyst Award to a T1 Translational Catalyst Program to include the award as it stands but also to have a separate freestanding customized consultation program and then a pilot microgrants program. And I, the second and the third components of so the consultation program and microgrants program are designed to really uh, be uh, rapid turnover with minimal process, designed to help us identify the science to invention earlier programs a little bit better. So, um, T1 Translation Award Program is also being, we're in the process of working on expanding, the diff, expanding to have multiple tracks, not just therapeutics, but diagnostics devices. M Health, as well as orphan and rare diseases, we're talking with many potential industry collaborators help to fund some of these different tracks. So again, instead of, uh, so we're, we're, it turns out that the T1 Catalyst Program is a, a, a very interesting platform for the in industry. In, in, in forming a potential collaboration with us. So we have been actively discussing that possibility with a number of different companies, so stay tuned. And then, so again, I think it's it, the, one of the most important things that, that are gonna help to, to really extend the T1 translational capability or capacity in academia is gonna be innovative partnerships with industry, innovate, innovative par par partnerships with early stage investors, uh, founda foundations, venture philanth philanthropy, and others. And we are um, exploring many of these avenues as we speak, so please stay tuned there as well. Near term focus, I'm going to be working on enhancing the T1 Translational Catalyst program and building and enhancing the inno innovative partnerships and working closely with Eric from uh, the EVC's office as well, and then continuing to assess for opportunities and in figuring out ways to do uh, multidisciplinary cross-fertilization, so important in the translational process from bench to bedside, bedside to bench, community bench and bedside, and then, and then also um, really starting to think about what sort of T1-focused education, both didactic and otherwise, would be useful. And then as we just finished talking about definition of success, how are we going to measure uh, whether or not we're making an impact? So, how you can help me, let me know. Uh, if, for those of you who I haven't met with, let me know when things, if you know of things that are working well, things that aren't working well around the campus um, uh, all years. Uh, if you are aware of interesting and successful programs here or elsewhere that I'd be aware of that we should evaluate, please let me know that too. If you have any project program or issue um, that CTSI or I in particular may be able to help with, please call and contact me because I think that's part. Of, that's going to be part of my database in trying to figure out where where the gaps are on this university. And then again, other inputs are also appreciated. Dynamic environment um, means that we have to. You know, we're going to. We're going to need to do a, a continual evaluation to identify and address gaps, and this means we're going to need to be agile, and we're going to need to be willing to take some small risks. But most of all, I think we're really going to need to work together because this is really a multidisciplinary process. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, June. So. So June's just getting going here. So it's already a, a lot of plans and a lot on your plate in a short period of time. Um, any, any questions from the group? 
we didn't really give you too much time, too, to talk about some of the exciting things that are sort of in the works. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, there are many. <laughs> We think, and, and I wanted to just explain maybe before we transition, if there are no questions, the, the, this, why the T1 Catalyst platform work, seems to work so well. So one of, the, one of the challenges in working with anybody outside the university is for them to know that they're interacting with the best folks within UCSF, right? That these are the best projects that might meet their needs. Uh, and otherwise, our, the environment is just too overwhelming. They can't understand what the heck's going on. There are just too many people. From our perspective, too, when we've tried to do matchmaking without any kind of assessment of projects in, in that, it's overwhelming, too. We get, you know, we say our doors open, a lot of people come, a lot of what they bring isn't worthwhile. And then a lot of people who are doing the greatest stuff aren't motivated to bring their stuff in. So what T1 Catalyst does is it encourages people to submit their things for us to evaluate, for us to prioritize them, and then to present them to, to buyers, basically you know, to potential partners, whether they're foundation partners or industry par partners, or whether it's our money that we're spending on it. And that, that seems to be working to, to help to, 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 to bridge those gaps. So, so to take off on what was talked about earlier with profiles, I'm wondering if there's any consideration, especially what Clay just said, on being able to drive profiles into that marketplace. Mm. Maybe not being individuals even always, but programmatic right. pro pro programmatic profiles where yeah. we are the best asthma center in the country or we right. are the best. And here's what we offer so that people can come into UCSF right. and understand right. Right. what our, what we're offering up. So we don't uh -huh. have to necessarily always go out, but we would be right. a place where people would come to if they have an interest in a disease area or in a, in a, in a biology area or in a, um, in a group of people. Right, no, I think that's, that's a great comment and there has been discussions and there's some thinking around not just saying this is the best asthma center, but really internally compiling a disease biology area that we have a continuum of expertise on from ba all the way from basic to, uh, basic to animal models to, to clinical expertise and really compi compiling those teams to, to, to be ready to engage quickly. So, yes, and, and, and being able to, being able to uh, use, I think, profiles to a certain extent to, to, to initiate that, uh, that, that compilation of teams. Yeah, it's a stay, stay tuned. We're, we're sort of selling that as part of a package in some of these relationships, including the recent Pfizer one, and then we'll try to deliver on their needs. And through that, we'll pr try to improve the product from their perspective. I had a comment and a question. The, the first comment is we've, we as a campus, we've done so much better at talking about ourselves and what we're doing. And you know, our website is better. Our, we have people who are around going around looking for good work that people are doing. We, we mine good, paper, good publications and write about it in plain English. And I think we should encourage the campus to continue to put resources in that because that'll help yes. elevate a lot of the, I mean, it'll tell the stories and yes. internally we'll learn and externally people will learn about us as well because they will pick, pick that information up. And I think we've been doing so much better. We just mm -hmm. don't let that be one of the things we drop the ball on. And yes. my question is, uh, Jeff, and your, your, your push to us was to the decade of human biology. And I wondered, maybe I missed this, but how is how are the two tied together, and are there is there complete overlap with your goals in that and, and the goals here at the CTSI? Um, well, we're in the process now of sort of our. Did you have no uh, statement? reports to our office and so Clay and Suzanne and others are talking all the time um, that this is an incredibly integrated uh, process mm -hmm. but what I don't want to lose in this and this is why I asked the question earlier on is that in a sense the decade of human biology has a broader definition than what's being talked about here for translational research it's also talking about the human as a complex organism to do very basic research on 
it's, it's human biology from the most basic research on. And so we're going to, if anything, make sure that uh, the, the research community is involved as well. So it's not just a, a full overlapping Venn diagram. Great. Well, I think we better move on. But thank you very much, June.